Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Triangulation is brought to you by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Triangulation with Tom Merritt and Leo Laporte. Episode 25, recorded September 21st, 2011. Captain Crunch, Part 2. So you may remember Mr. John Draper from our previous triangulation, one of our earliest triangulations. He's known as Captain Crunch because he was the guy who discovered that the whistle that was given out for free in the box of Captain Crunch cereal just happened to hit 2,600 hertz, the exact tone you'd need to take control of the long-distance telephone system. Was it one hole you covered for 2,600? <laughs> uh, yeah, because really when you blow the whistle, there was really two distinct notes, and you had to, you had to mute one of the notes, right, so that's right. what you blew the hole for. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, anyway, welcome back, John. It's great. It's great to have you. In fact, what Glad I, to would, be here again. I would encourage anybody because what happened? We had such a great conversation the first time. We ran out of time, and 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 in fact, unfortunately, we left you in jail the last time. <laughs> in, the <story. laughs> in the story, in the story, you were in yeah. the Alameda County Jail. Just to recap, there had been an article written about you in 1971 about phone freaking, in which they talk about John Draper. And apparently brought you to the attention of federal authorities who thereafter... Yeah, that was the Esquire article. Yeah, they kind of scapegoated you. They said, hey, we're going to go after this guy. Uh, and you were arrested on, uh, on toll fraud charges in 1972. Um, right. So it was, in, it was in the great tradition of jail writers like uh, Malcolm X. Who else wrote, uh, wrote uh, jail, jail novels? You in, took your time in jail to write out Instead of Easy a novel, a <laughs> word processor. Yeah, it was an ideal programming environment. It was absolutely perfect. I went to this uh, old practice studio in Berkeley where I, uh, I kind of faked my employer, uh, who was going to be my quote-unquote employer. And I, uh, I would go there every morning, show up, uh, and work on Easy Writer uh, using, I wrote it in fourth. Then Waz came out and let me borrow his Cume printer. And uh, that's what made Easy Writer really shine because it was the first word processor program for a small microcomputer that would actually use direct proportional spacing. Oh, wow. And then after I got done coding for the day, I would print out a hard copy of the, of the program and uh, bring it to my notebook and bring it back to jail, at which time then I would just simply write the stack diagram out and debug it by hand. Wow. And I got really familiar with the code that way, and make changes to it, and scribbled on the piece of paper like I knew what I was doing. <laughs> <laughs> and, then at the, and then when I came in the next day, I made the changes to it, and it was really cool. So you'd write it out while you were at night in jail, and then you'd go out and work furlough, and you'd actually have a machine you could enter the code into. Yeah, yeah, during the day, yeah. How come fourth? Uh, fourth was the only really true computer language at the time that I could use for Apple II. Uh, there was, of course, uh, BASIC and Integer BASIC. Um, I didn't like Integer BASIC that well. Yeah, fourth, fourth is in a kind of a very cool language uh, because... Yeah, it was developed by Charles Moore from the Kitt Peak, Kitt Peak Observatory because of its small size and very, very small footprint, and it's very efficient. It's a threaded language, and it's an interactive language. It's interactive and extensible. So uh, the language becomes the application, and the application becomes a language. You said There's no it, really dividing line between right. the language and the application. You said it was self-documenting, and it's almost because you write a vocabulary, right, and forth, and then... Exactly. And then the, and then the, the program is almost like English. It's almost like you're writing... I mean, it's reverse Polish, so it may be... And all I had to do is just, I just had to type doc, D-O-C, and forth, the fourth word, and it would give me the documentation on the fourth word. That's so cool. So it's self-documenting. I interviewed Charles Moore at, on Tech TV at Tech Live, and uh, I, I was praising him for fourth. He said, I'm surprised anybody remembers it. But, but they were, it was hot, widely used for robotics to control telescopes. Um, it was well, he has also got fourth on a chip. It's embeddable, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 
So it's it's very, I think Fourth's very cool. And of course, part of the reason it was so successful is that great book starting Fourth with the cartoons, which I just loved. And uh, Fourth, I was part of the Fourth Interest Group booth, and I was did the Fourth implementation on the Apple II. You did and the I Apple can II remember... Fourth implementation? Yeah. Oh, wow. And then I would go to the uh, bike shop on my bicycle, and I would do, I'd do handwritten documentation. And then I would uh, really neatly handwritten and then show you how to start it up. And it, it, would, it documented itself. Um, it was really cool. And then I would put it in little plastic Ziploc baggies and <laughs> the floppy, and, and then I would deliver it to the bite shop in Berkeley and in San Francisco. That's how software was sold in those days, at the bite shop and baggies. Yeah. Yep. What did you program okay. in before? Uh, assembly language, 6502 assembly language. I wrote the, uh, I wrote the telephone interface board uh, for the Apple II. Wow. Uh, but software for that was in, done in, uh, in Integer Basic and in, in Assembly Language, 6502. So did, so did you know, uh, you knew it was at this time. In fact, how did you meet Oh, yeah, Waz? yeah. Uh, I met Waz after the Esquire article came out uh, through a friend of mine in Berkeley, told me that he knew this guy who was building a blue box, and it was a digital blue box. So he talked me into going down to the UC Berkeley dorm, and I went down to the dorm, and that's where I met Waz and a few of his friends down there. And uh, he had this digital blue box. Uh, the blue box was digital, very, very accurate frequencies, but unfortunately the waveform on the box was not a pure waveform. So if you used that box, you would get noticed by the phone company if you, uh, you know, you'd maybe get about, you'd, your call would go through about 50% uh, about of the time. You had to hold the acoustical coupler to the phone just exactly right, and uh, this would allow you to uh, allow you to uh, kind of make it almost a square wave into a sine wave using the uh, using the impurities of the uh, carbon mic on the on the phone. <laughs> and uh, did you mentor uh, Waz at the time? Well, I, he didn't know how to use it, so I had to teach him how to use it. So uh, I. Uh, he wanted me to make a call to the Pope. <laughs> and why not? And so that was our first call we made, actually, as I remember correctly. Uh, so I called Rome Information, the Rome operator, and got the number to the Vatican. So this would have been Pope Paul? I'm not sure which Pope yeah, it was. Yeah, probably. <laughs> he was there but, a long uh, time. It's a pretty good guess. Yeah. <laughs> it was uh, 4 a.m. in the morning at the Vatican. <laughs> and, uh, so I, I get, uh, get the... Uh, the uh, phone receptionist on the line, he didn't speak a word of English. Right. And so uh, I said, this is the overseas operator. We have an urgent call coming in from the United States uh, from K Mr. Kissinger's office, actually. <laughs> <laughs> so you were kind of a prankster, I, I think, John. <laughs> so, yeah. And so uh, the guy got an English-speaking person on the line, and then I handed the phone over to Waz and says, go ahead and talk. He says, I, I got to call, talk, I need to talk to the Pope right away. And the guy says, what for? He says, because I want to confess. Oh, Lord. So uh, well, suffice well, to say, the Pope yeah. didn't come on the line. Uh, the Pope was asleep, and they didn't want to wake him up. I think you and Wes <clears throat> must have gotten along very well together, because you obviously have the same sense of humor. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's, it's not unusual, I guess, for... Uh, there must be something about people who like to hack, they like to break barriers, and they like to do pranks mm -hmm. and jokes and practical jokes. Is that, has that been your experience? Oh, yeah, yeah. No, wait for my book to come out. I'm working on my book oh, now. Oh, how exciting. Gina Smith's yeah. working with you on that. Yeah, that's right. Gina Smith is working with me on it. I'm actually going to be uh, out in Palo Alto tomorrow, but uh, I'm going to see her sometime while I'm, not, while I'm out there. She's to, a perfect uh, person to do that with you. Yeah, I know, I know. I, she's really excited about it. I'm really excited about it. And I've been gathering together all my notes and my recordings and stuff like that. And I wrote a little program to help me uh, transcribe my book. It's called Endicta, E-N-D-I-C-T-A. It's a Macintosh application program that runs under Snow Leopard. And it's got a little editor, and it's got a, a recorder. And I can import recorded sounds from my little digital voice recorder, or I can just simply record from the, mi from the microphone of the Mac, and I would record it. And then I, when I played it back, I would listen to the recording, and then I would speak into the microphone, and it would go into Mac Speech Dictate. And Mac Speech Dictate would then write the code right into the editor right there where I could see it on the, on the screen. 
So it's kind of a tech mixture of a text editor and a voice recorder all, all in one. So it was used for transcriptions. And I wrote it for the purpose side because I needed one really badly. So you so, still uh, use Apple stuff, huh? Yeah, I'm talking to you on my good old Mac right now, actually. <laughs> I think it's, that's another kind of, that was a kind of uh, tradition among early programmers, <laughs> is if you needed something, well, you couldn't go you to wrote the it store. Yourself. You wrote it yourself. Right. Yeah, that was pretty much the old traditional way of programming. I mean, that's how the Homebrew Computer Club got started. You know, it wasn't until Bill Gates came out with his programs that people thought about the idea of actually buying programs. Oh, that's the, interesting. Well, because you had to build computers yourself for such a long right, time. Right, exactly. You know, the idea the of Altair programming. The Altair 880 and the MSI and all these other computers that came out there at the time. The Altair was the first computer in a kit. In a and way... It was featured in... Electro, uh, it was featured in... Uh, popular in electronics, popular right? electronics. Yeah, yeah. In a way, that's what's missing. I think it's what's missing from ham radio today. It's what's missing from computing today. In the, in the old days, you had to build your own ham gear. You had to build your own... <laughs> yeah. Uh, computer, you had to write your own software. But you see it in robotics. You see it yeah. in uh, 3D printing. So there's still arenas where that that it's at that same stage. So are there cool. any fourths yep. on the on the Mac, or what do you what do you? Oh yeah, well actually, uh, actually, uh, when the Mac first came out, there was Mac fourth. I didn't I didn't implement it, and uh, I didn't really develop in that fourth system because the person who wrote that fourth system required me to pay them a license fee yeah. for every application I would develop for them. Yeah. So I shunned using it. I just said, well, why do I have to pay this guy to use a language to write a language, you know, to write a program? It's right. ridiculous. The guy got a little greedy, so I just didn't buy his program, nor did I, nor did I endorse it. It wasn't until later on that other four systems came out, and I just got involved with Consular C at the time. That's probably my first uh, oh. my first entry into into the C programming language. That was a great that uh, that was such a fast compiler, and I loved that. Well, back then it was only on a 128k Mac. I was just constantly swapping floppy disks back and forth <laughs> ten times just to print the words "Hello World" on the screen. <laughs> so we were talking and, we were talking about how people in the old days had to make their own stuff and build their own stuff and write their own software. Uh, I guess that's kind of coming back a little bit with the maker movement, but you never stopped. You still, you still obviously oh, yeah. write the like, stuff you use. Like, I'm always a believer in do your own stuff, you know? Yeah. Roll your own. And that's one of the other things I'm getting involved in, too, that might, might interest your viewers, is I'm getting involved in doing a consortium on, uh, on the five major social issues on sustainability today, financial st sustainability uh, as we know, we're in a big Ponzi scheme as, as we are right now, and we're dealing with a lot of issues with energy, food, water, and all these other things. And this consortium, I'm calling it EcoViso, E-C-O-V-I-S-O, -O, uh, EcoViso.com. It's not, the website's not up yet. We're in the middle of working on it. I'd say within 30 days, we should be up and running. And uh, we are also on the EcoViso on Google+. Plus. So uh, uh, get a hold of me on Google+, Plus and I'll add you to my EcoViso circle. Awesome. And every now and then I would have a, uh, I would have a, uh, a Google Plus, uh, what do you call it, Hangout. Oh, yeah. And, and come in there and we can discuss the issues on how to do it. And the idea right now is I'm getting involved with hacker spaces to build and design a steam power generator using old 100-year-old old technology that would charge a 2,500 watt using an alternator, a car alternator, and a steam engine and a pulley system generate power to charge batteries. And the idea is it's gonna, it would work on a campfire, everything from a campfire, potbelly stove, to a solar heater. And I thought that'd be a cool project to get involved in. <laughs> You're amazing, John. You say, I am Captain Crunch, one of the so-called legions of the old school. I don't know if there are many old school folks left anymore, John. Right. They're becoming more rare. Less legion than, a, than they used to be. So I love it that you have hangouts with people. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I just don't have time to set one up right now because, like I said, I've got to be in, got to be up to the Bay Area this week, and then next week I might have a little time to start working on it. But I want to get the EcoVizzo.com website up first, and then I'm going to start actively promoting it so, uh, through social networks, through my uh, Facebook page. So you you met Jobs and you met Waz when they were doing blue boxes, and uh, they actually had a business selling them. Uh, for a yeah, while. Waz was selling them for a while, and then the money he used to sell the blue boxes was used to print the PC boards, get the PC boards printed out for the Apple One. So you were there at the beginning. What did you think of these young guys? 
Oh, I was fascinated by by micro microcomputers. I mean, I had a 6800, and I was going to do a 6800 microprocessor at the time. I was working for Call Computer, a small little independent uh, time sharing system in Mountain View, California, and uh, I wrote all the cross assemblers for all the different uh, all the different uh, processors: the 8088, 6502, 6800, the F8, and a number of others that I recall. And everybody'd go to Call Computer, and they would. Uh, they would type in their programming, their, their language in assembly language with mnemonics, and they would convert the assembly language into machine code. And then it would then punch a paper tape, punch paper tape, that they can use the paper tape to load into their loader. Uh, that was how you could get programs in. They didn't actually have lot back then. No way to store it and, but a paper, and yeah. It, yeah. In fact, so, that, and that, that was the first foray into, uh, into uh, programming languages. In fact, Steve Wozniak used the cross assembler. Really? Uh, Randy Wigginton took a copy of my 6800 cross assembler and, wrote it and converted it into a 6502 cross assembler. And then that, that cross assembler was then used, and the printout that you see in the Red Book, mm. the, uh, the original Apple documentation called the Red Book, the code you see in the back of that Red Book is the source code for the monitor. Okay. So and that was printed out on a call computer printer. Wow, that's really neat. So uh, a cross-assembler allows you to write code for a different machine, on, on one machine for a different machine. So nobody, exactly. nobody had an Apple at the time. because they were right. <laughs> So in order to write software for them, they'd write it on, a, on another computer. You had to have an existing computer, like a main timeshare system. Right. And then they could cross you, I would then just use an editor, a line editor, for the timeshare system. And then I would write the code, and then I would run the uh, cross assembler, and then the cross assembler would take the mnemonic code, like LDA, load load register A, STA, store register A, and uh, these are these are like mnemonics that allowed you to be able to just move things from register to register and manipulate them in such a way to actually make a program. But the LDA and the SDA would actually convert into into uh, into hexadecimal digits, or just a uh, uh, an opcode would then convert into a uh, into the machine language, which is nothing more than just bit patterns, which should then be fed into the computer, which is the, which is the actual code, to give machine you, language. To code. give you an idea of how far we've come, this is the Red Book was the manual that came with your Apple II computer. Here's a, a facsimile of the Red Book on, uh, <laughs> on the screen. Don't throw away the packing material. And, and by the way, what's really cool about this is... And this is what they don't do anymore. This came with source code. Yeah, there was. Yeah, a show the source code in the back. Go to yeah, the back. Yeah, let me go. Let me go way down to the end. They have a, uh, a copy of this at the Digibarn down in Santa Cruz. That right. you could browse yeah. through. Yeah, that I've been able to look so at. So circuit boards. I mean, this is this is in the days when people who bought an Apple II wanted this stuff. They were. They, right. they kind of needed it. They, really? Yeah, you had to fix it yourself. <laughs> So uh, this is system timing signals. Here's there we go. Here's the uh, all of the uh, all of the uh, hex addresses for inputs and stuff. Yeah, these were copied from the 6502 manual. <laughs> or part of the 6502. I'm, to, I'm gonna find now, the source code. Did here Call think. Computer know that you were using it? To oh, they to supported me 100. Yeah, okay. percent yeah. I wrote a tracker. Call Computer was making extra money because we had a tracker on it. <laughs> okay. And so if you had an account with Call Computer. We charge about a dollar and a dollar an hour for the use of the program. So you weren't sneaking in and using the call computer. They, no, they no. I was working for them. Yeah, yeah. Actually, so I here's, was like one of their employees. You're expanding. Here's, their here's the uh, teletype driver routines by Randy and Steve. Uh, right. Yeah. In 6502 assembler. Yeah. Right. Yep. Yeah. And that the, the the code those little digits you see over on the left that's the actual machine code and the stuff on the right is assembly code <laughs> so there's a one-to-one -one correlation between that's the right. assembly code on the right and the machine code on the left now at the homebrew computer club when steve wozniak first uh, introduced the apple one he would actually type in <laughs> the not not the mnemonics like you see there but the stuff on the left he'd write a nine eight two eight right, five exactly. three he'd six there for memory <laughs> and type the whole thing for memory he was hand assembling <laughs> right exactly literally assembling yeah and wow. then he got the integer basic working until uh, some clumsy geek trip over the power cord oh. and unplugged it <laughs> had to enter it all in again well, it wasn't too long after that that Steve built a, uh, built a, uh, wrote some software that would take the audio from a cassette recorder and convert the digital data 
into uh, audio tones, which would then uh, store this on a cassette tape. And then when you want to play it back, you would just simply type in uh, the starting address where you want to load the code, like 800G or something like that, and it would and that would actually start the code at 800. You'd load it in. And uh, yeah. this was built into the monitor ROM itself. And then you, that was on the Apple II, actually, that you did that. Well, that's how I saved my first programs, was to cassette tape. So, so right. Waz wrote that, huh? Yeah. yeah, yeah. And he used some very clever algorithms. And those algorithm, algorithms that he used was very similar to the algorithms he used to store data on a floppy disk. In fact, he, he uh, had some really incredible engineering. He was able to get amazing densities on a floppy disk. Because back in the day... Those uh, those uh, five and a quarter inch floppy disks had only maybe 110k of data, and he was able to expand that out to 140k using just a cassette recorder and a, and a floppy disk, you know, using the same technology. And he used all kinds of digital processing and stuff like that that he picked up in engineering school for while well, he was going to UC Berkeley. Did you have any sense? I mean, this is this. Everybody, you know, it was a homebrew computer club. It was hobbyists. Uh, you know, Waz was uh, first among equals, maybe. But I mean, uh, did you have any sense about where this might be going? That these two guys were starting a company that would end up being this, you know, major corporate success right, in America, yeah, passing Exxon in value. Yeah, I actually did have a sense to some extent. I knew that programs would eventually uh, be. Uh, be sold just like you can. Um, so you, it you wasn't weren't like very Richard long. Stallman. You weren't offended by that idea. You... <coughs> well, I knew that there. I knew that there was going to have things going to branch off into two different two different things: uh, open source and uh, and pay for source. I mean, it was even it even started way back when. Even then, huh? I mean, uh, oh yeah, yeah. Well, here this is the ultimate open source. You're getting the Apple II Mini Assembler. When you yeah. buy an Apple II, you get the asset. In fact, so open source, you have to enter this code in to run it. <laughs> right. Uh, well, actually, no, that code was in ROM. Did it come on ROM? Okay. So why yeah, did they I give people the code? Why did he give people the code? Mm -hmm. Well, just so people could understand it. Uh, it was Waz's idea to do that. Then later on, when the Apple II E came out with the new monitor ROM, that was closed source. Ah, uh, interesting. And you can thank uh, Steve Jobs for that. Yeah. So, so what, uh, what was the difference at the time between Wozniak and Jobs? Jobs was more of a marketing type of person. He did understand digital logic pretty well. Uh, he uh, he, uh, he kind of looked at me kind of downward a little bit when I said I was using some analog circuitry for the phone board. He says, ew, analog, ew. <laughs> You know, because he wanted me to do it all digitally. Uh -huh. Some things and, never uh, Yeah. Yeah, so was, uh, I mean, Jobs was, was a little bit, uh, you know, I wrote some really interesting applications. I think what really, really kind of rubbed Jobs the wrong way with me was one time I was at, at Apple. I just got done building the phone board. I wrote some test code in assembly language, and I wrote a little program that dials a number, and I gave, left it on Waz's desk. And see, here's a program for you. It was driven by Integer Basic. I wrote a little Integer Basic program that let you enter in a phone number and it would dial it. And Wozniak put it, in, put it into an infinite loop and entered the number and it would dial it, hang up, dial it, hang up, dial it. It was Steve Jobs' phone number. <laughs> and so I go to the next day to Apple and Jobs was just coming down on me like you wouldn't believe. I says, why are you so mad at me? And he says, why are you calling my house number over and over and over again? I didn't do it. And Jobs, and Waz did it. And so kind of like kind of rubbed Jobs the wrong way. There was a lot of little things, little frictions going on at Apple that kind of rubbed people the wrong way. Uh, back in the day, people would smoke in the office. Oh, I know you hate and, uh, smoking. Rod Holt and Mike Markula and Mike Scott, all three of those guys smoked. There was one instance, it's probably in the Apple lore, uh, Apple lore uh, documents at Apple. The one time I kicked Mike Scott out of my office for smoking, <laughs> he didn't appreciate that too much. He was the president at the time. Yeah, of course. <laughs> at the time of the company. But uh, you're, you're famous uh, for just hating cigarette smoke. Oh, it causes me major problems. I mean, I have always, ever since I've grown up, I've always had 
some major problems with smoking. My mom and dad both smoke, and every time we go on road trips, they'd smoke in the car. And I kept getting sick all the time in the car, and they thought I was road sick. Mm. And it wasn't. It was just, I was just, you know. Smoke. And later on, I had an allergy test. They found out I was like 10,000 times more sensitive to cigarette smoke than anywhere else. So I had a lot of problems, you know, in the past. Eventually, laws changed, and now California is one of the most liberal non-smoking states. And in fact, Burbank, where I live, is a non-smoking city. You can't even smoke in public in Burbank. So you're happy now. <laughs> yeah. You won. You won, John. <laughs> and also Germany and Holland, uh, and now also the UK now have no smoking laws, which is really cool. I can now go to a beer garden in Germany and uh, go into a restaurant and not be bothered by smoking anymore. Do you feel like there's something about you that rubs people the wrong way? Oh, absolutely. I mean, people are saying that I have a slight uh, tad of Asperger's syndrome, and although I haven't really been kind of psychologically involved, you know, you know uh, evaluated yet uh you know um i sort of had a sheltered life when i was growing up and a lot of those details are going to be in my book by the way uh the book that i'm the book that i'm working on is going to be a lot of a lot of like how i am the way i am mm. how i become who i am now and the steps i took to get there it's starting from my childhood not going too deep into my childhood but going into some very significant events in my life that led up to where I am now. Do you think you're, you have Asperger's? I don't know. I don't really care. <laughs> yeah, who cares, right? It seems like care. that term gets thrown around a lot with hackers, programmers, people who are creative. Do you think that there is something uh, in those symptoms that people might see that lends themselves as a positive to your being able to, to create? There could be. I, I, I really believe that there are positive aspects of uh, Asperger's in many instances. There are, of course, uh, negative aspects as well. I mean, so that's always a, uh, always uh, an issue. You know? let, me, let me put it this way. What are some of the things that maybe growing up you thought were, or were a detriment or you wish you weren't that way that turned out to be a benefit later on where you're like, you know what, actually that's, that's helping me out? Oh, I was a 97-pound weakling, a geek, and I was always into, like, you know, uh, experimenting around with stuff. And I never was really hot in sports in school. Uh, I was kind of uncoordinated. You know, it wasn't really, uh, it wasn't until after I got into high school that I started lifting weights and became a little bit more buff than I was then. And that helped me out a lot, too. I never got, I never got harassed after that. So it was, uh, I can remember the day when I was at Travis Air Force Base. I was living there. I was going to uh, Vacaville High School at the time. And uh, they had a teen club right next to the gym, the, wor the workout room in at the base. I was lifting weights in the base, and there was a weight there that I just got used. And one of the, one of the, the, the hoods or whatever they call it come up to me and says, oh, uh, lifting weights, huh? So he says, uh, yeah, go ahead and try it. Turn over. He couldn't even put it over his head. <laughs> you know, I did it three times and walked out. Nice. And then he offered me a, he's offered me a seat on the bus the next day. So. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Well, you're among friends now. We're a bunch of, uh, I don't know about you. Yeah. I don't know about you, Mr. Merritt, but we're a bunch of geeks here. You don't. <laughs> <laughs> I can't tell about you. I'm not sure. You look like you might be normal. For sure. <laughs> Do you, it, in some ways, it's, kind of, it's fun to celebrate not being normal. You know, who wants to be normal? Who wants to be like everybody else? Exactly. I mean, you know, I mean, that's half the fun, being different, right? Yeah. It's made I mean, you even who Apple, you are. Even Apple. Think their, different. Their advertising campaign, Think Different. Think there Different. Who made Apple successful. That was, kind of, that was Jobs' idea, I think, actually. He was the marketing guy. So Yeah, yeah. So, uh, do you feel like, uh, uh, are you still friends with Steve Wozniak? Do you, you feel... Oh, uh, Wozniak. Oh, absolutely. I call yeah. him up anytime I want to talk to him and stuff, but he's, uh, I think he's, uh, he was in South Africa last week. He, he came travels back for like a few crazy, days. I know. He lives inside airplanes. Yeah. He should guy. get his own airplane. <laughs> yeah, he should. He could afford it. <laughs> well, how about Jobs? Well, actually, you ever talk to Steve Jobs at all? No, no. Jobs totally distances me. He's in his own little bubble. Um, I lost contact with Jobs uh, right after I got busted uh, using the phone board in Pennsylvania. It'll all be in the book. Uh, so Jobs sort of like, uh, you know, he, 
course, he's got his own problems right now. Unfortunately, yeah. he had to resign from Apple because of his health situation. But uh, he uh, he never really uh, never really liked me that much because after the phone board came out, you know, there was a lot of good applications that the phone board could be used for, and Jobs uh, basically uh, said, "We can't market this. It can be used for too many illegal things." Mm. So because my phone board had it had evil thoughts, it, it never <laughs> made the marketplace. But then you wrote Easy Rider. Well, yeah, that was after I got back in yeah. during jail, yeah. So tell me about the phone board. What, what did it do? The phone board would allow you to be able to send any tone and receive any tone. Not just DTMF tones? Any tone. You just had a tone table, a 256-byte table of, you know, 8-bit digits. So it was a tone generator. Exactly. And it had a sine wave in this table. And then you skip to the little table, and you make in, you'd output the output of the uh, of the data into a uh, into a digital analog converter. Now I had I was using an eight bit DAC DAC digital analog converter. When Wozniak says you can use a six bit DAC, it's much much cheaper, but you can use the two address lines for, for data bits. lines. <laughs> right. That was Woz right there in a nutshell. Yeah, that was Woz. He he <laughs> cut off three chips. <laughs> Why I'm use eight? Why use eight bits when you can? When six will work. <laughs> exactly. That's was in a nutshell. So we used the programmable phase lock loop, which meant that I just had to just program the phase lock loop to detect two tones at once, and then when those two tones were present, the phase lock loop would lock in on those tones, and now how you could detect the tones, it could tell the difference between a busy, uh, a person talking on the phone, although it couldn't decode what the person was talking. But it could tell the difference between a ring, a busy, a warble tone, a quick order, a uh, dial tone, of course. And I wrote a little program that would, uh, uh, that would dial into the 800 watts extender numbers. And you would try a code, then hang up, dial the 800 number again, try another code, hang up, dial the 800 number again. And I let this thing run over, uh, over a weekend, and I found about six watts extender codes for me. And this was when I was out hang gliding when I was living in Mountain View. And I come back, and then the security agent, Alex, contacted me a few days later and says, uh, are you aware that you've been making, that 80% of all long-distance calls out of Mountain View came from your phone? <laughs> <laughs> and so it wasn't anything I was doing illegal, because at the time, uh, uh, there was no, it was not illegal to do what I was doing. It's, that's a war dialer nowadays, right? Yeah, yeah. exactly. That's, right. Uh, and there's a, they, I think they pass laws against that now. Oh, I'm sure they have. So, the, so the, yeah. the board was not just to make tones. You could receive make, and tones. So there, basically you, you have Receive and transmit tones. You had control of the, uh, you had control of the, of the on-hook, off-hook. You can pick up the phone. You can hang up the phone. Uh, you had, you had, a, I had a command to pick up the phone, hang up the phone. I had a command to dial a number. You'd put the number into a, uh, into a table of memory on the computer. You'd point to that table, and it would just dial that number. And the numbers, the digits would be just standard old digits, the ASCII code for the numbers. And it would convert that ASCII code to a number and then uh, feed it into the tone table that would tell you how far to skip ahead each time to make the frequencies. See, this is, you have both an analog and a digital side to you, don't you? I mean, you have to know analog to be able to do this as well. Yeah, right, right, exactly. So when I was in the analog circuit here, uh, I was able to do that, yeah. So, Easy Writer, I don't know how this happened. You wrote it, uh, uh, what, in 1980 for the Apple II, but it became, very famously, the first word processor for the IBM PC. Yeah, IBM started looking around at, at, uh, at uh, for people to do the uh, word processor program, and they came up with Easy Writer. And... Uh, so, uh, did they know? Did second. you meet with the, the guys in Boca Raton? Uh oh, what's that? Uh oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt there. You had a phone no, no, call. it was okay. This call came in. Okay, you, anyway, did, you, go did, ahead. The, did those guys, those those guys with the skinny black ties and the short sleeve white shirts in Boca Raton, did you meet with them? Oh, I had a skinny black tie. <laughs> you were one of them, huh? <laughs> was that is that so they Back would then, they wouldn't attack? They didn't convert the they didn't convert the fat ties until like <laughs> 19. So 1969, <laughs> I had a, a skinny black tie with the pocket protector. I was real. Oh, uh, you were a geek. Did, were your glasses taped up? 
Uh, no. I, actually, there was a time when they broke, and I had to tape them up. Yeah. Yeah, yeah see? Yeah. They're, they're, you might actually be the inspiration for that that geek icon. The model. <laughs> the, the, the model. <laughs> yeah, the old pocket protector. Because <laughs> I was in engineering tech working for a national semiconductor at the time, characterizing linear, app, linear op amps, 741, 101, 301 op amps. So you were you so were you kind of a square early on, and then you just became uh, a counterculture figure, or were you always? Uh, well, I went to in high school. I went to a special vocational tech school when I was in high school at City College. Uh, the first uh, the afternoons, uh, I would take care of all my general ed stuff in the morning classes, and then in the afternoon they let me go to a three hour. Uh, tech school kind of thing at City College uh, called the Vocational Center thing and I did electronics there and then I went into the military and uh, after I graduated out of uh, out of basic training by the way I, I made pretty good at basic training I was like a marksman I, I did I made it 97th percentile ace the obstacle course I wow. it was there was nothing I couldn't do and uh, then when I went to uh, Keesler Air Force Base uh, for tech training, I phased ahead six weeks. Hmm. And I was uh, making money on the side, tutoring people who, you know, teach them uh, how to pass the test, you know. So uh, then I learned all my tech school there. It was like a, it was like a 21 week tech school. And I got stationed in Alaska. Uh, worked at a radar site called Indian Mountain Air Force Station. Now, that was a real dump. <laughs> Stationed there for a whole year. Um, were, were you, that was when I got. That's when I got into phone hacking. I, uh, I, uh, I that that was a time that I said, "Oh God, I was so bored." Boredom, uh, see, boredom. That's that's what yep. killed the cat. And I had to. Uh, I had to just occupy myself. I had a radio station there, but that that didn't give me much satisfaction. Were you were you ever a ham? Yeah, I was a ham. In fact, I was on the Mars station. Uh, I'd go on the Mars station and. Uh, and worked all the, but I was very limited in what I could work. I wasn't allowed to talk to any Russians, and they were so loud I couldn't hear them. I mean, they were so loud, they're like bending my estimator practically. I mean, I was only 20 miles away from Russia. <laughs> I wasn't allowed to talk to them, of course. I'm uh, surprised sorry, sorry. you weren't recruited by, uh, you know, the NSA or some of these three-letter agencies. Yeah. It's their loss, not mine. They never approached you, huh? No, no, not at all. So, uh, yeah, I learned how to get into the Audubon network, and, uh, and uh, I figured out how to transfer from the Audubon to the commercial and the commercial to the Audubon. There were some gateways in uh, Nicholson Creek and Murphy Dome using the same switch that would uh, use both, uh, both the civilian and the military line for using the same switch, and you had to just come in at a certain, on a certain trunk level and a class mark. And so I figured out a way around that. And I was able to make free phone calls at home. Didn't take me long. What drove you? But it I wasn't was just boredom. It can't yeah, have just I mean, been boredom. Was it a desire to learn, a desire to explore? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I learned very early on that you can call different bases from the Audubon network, and it had priority calls. It can come in on a flash you, override. You weren't worried about getting in trouble? No, no. Things are pretty loose up there. In fact, the FCC uh, called me up uh, when I was broadcasting on my illegal transmitter. And they said, keep it clean and we won't shut you down. I was on a military base, so. Really? The, the FCC yeah, has changed quite happy. a bit since yes, then. <laughs> yeah, we're all one big happy government family. What can I yeah, say? Right. You know? <laughs> oh, I tell you. Uh, people probably don't know this, but whenever they use AutoCAD, they're using a little of a John Draper's code, aren't they? Uh, maybe. Uh, yeah, if they're using the right screen drivers and using the right cards for the screen driver, I'm sure. Yeah. So you but I was working mostly in the future group. I was doing stuff with AI. I was doing stuff with, uh, with a glove. You know Jaron Lanier? Oh, yeah. yeah. He did the data glove, worked yeah. for NASA. King of VR. Yeah. yeah. I, was, uh, I was the one who was using the, the writing the code to interface the data glove to 3D, uh, 3D line draws using your hands to make the manipulating your 3D objects you make. And I was in that part of the group. I was there. I was programming in C++. Then John Walker left the company. Right. And John Walker was my stabilizing force at, at AutoCAD or Autodesk. He was the he genius. was the person yeah. who yeah, he was the person who uh, 
who supported me in every way, shape, and form. Once he left the company, uh, my, my, my tenure there didn't last too long. And then also there was a, I had just offered, I'd, I'd just gotten a job offer at Apple using working in the ATG group. I'd already been interviewing three or four times oh, cool. at the ATG group at Apple. So, uh, and then uh, I had gotten, and then the, I was told to come on in the next day. But that was just bad timing. I can't believe how bad timing it was. Do you remember the new Prometheus League? No. Uh, the new Prometheus League had published a, a ad, address in one of the magazines that if you write to this address and send them $15, they'll sell you the source code to the Apple Macintosh's ROM Ooh. written in Pascal. Uh -oh. And, of course, Apple really got huffy about that. They had yeah. this FBI investigation going on. And uh, during this time... Uh, uh, a friend of mine, well, I was living in Alameda at the time. He, was living, he moved from my place to Apple. So I went down to Apple to give his VCR back. So I had been down there for the last interview, and then I got invited to the Apple Beer Bash, which they have every Friday, you know, beer and pizza. And so uh, I go to my car to give Walter his VCR, so... Uh, I was walking out to my car, give him the box, moved it from my car into his car, and then went back up to the beer bash at Apple. Well, during that time, the FBI was uh, tailing me. And they reported to Apple that I was doing some strange things between the trunk of my car and Walter's oh, car. Nice. And so I got called the very next day as I was just about ready to leave to go into work. First day at work, it says, Apple Legal called me and says, don't bother coming in, you're not, you're not hired. Uh, the FBI must have put pressure on Apple to say that I was under investigation for the new Prometheus League. Well, suffice to say, there was nothing they got on me because I didn't do it, of course. And, and But that just wiped out my chances of getting a really good job. What, what excites and ever you? ever since that time, I've never been able to find good work. <sighs> Bastards in the FBI. They've done that to yeah. so many people. What yeah, excites you about the future, John? Is there something you, th is there something you would, I, I, I know this is true for me, but is there something you are, would like to stick around for just so that you would see what happens in the future? I would like to make an impact on becoming and building sustainable communities, uh, grassroots communities where I can build a community and get the steps for building a community in such a way that we're not depending on large shipping lines to bring your food to your grocery market, but instead people growing their own food, people generating their own electricity, and people purifying their own water in such a way that our country can become more grassroots sustainable because we're just too dependent on gas right now. I mean, we're already at peak oil. I mean, uh, gas, what's it, four bucks a gallon now? What's it going to be next year? Six, seven bucks a gallon? It's eight bucks a gallon in, uh, in Iceland. So you want to do local, sustainable... Local, sustainable communities, both in the rural, rural and urban areas. And is that what EcoViso is about? Of, well, that's what EcoViso is all about. And that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to set up a consortium of people interested in working with me on what it's going to take. And I'm already visiting a lot of sustainable communities right now. And uh, people that are already have communities set up, both in the uh, rural and... and, and uh, in, in the cities and buildings, like a group of people living in a building and on top of the roof of the building would be solar panels and gardens and stuff like that. And people working together and not, not using monetary exchange anymore, but using exchange services, like skills for services. Okay. Like, uh, like a person who fixes cars, uh, he'll go fix your car for you if, if uh, the guy who grows the food can give him a, a supply of groceries for a month or two. Kind of that kind of thing where there's no really monetary exchange. It's all done on a local grassroots level. I like to build all these little communities all over the country, have them all linked together on the Internet. It almost sounds tribal. Yeah, sort of. But I think that's kind of exciting to For me. For such a high-tech guy, that's, a, that's kind of a complete left turn. There. Yeah, but it's, it's, cre it's creating another economy that you couldn't do before the Internet, but taking right. advantage of the way things should work on the local level. I think that's fascinating. Okay, let me give you an idea of what I'm talking about. Right now, if automakers would build electric vehicles with removable battery packs in their car, 
They pull up to a gas station, they remove a battery pack, they put in another battery pack, and off they go. The battery pack that's dead gets taken to the back of the gas station or, or um, service okay. station, charged on a, on a, a wind idea. turbine or solar panel, and off they go. Okay, there's other kinds of technology called fast cap systems. Yep. They, this, these people have a capacitor called the ultracapacitor. It's three times more power density than a lithium-ion battery. It doesn't require all these exotic materials like you can only get in China. Mm -hmm. And this thing could power an electric, they say that it can power an electric vehicle for 600 miles. And it's limited, and the charging time is limited only by the thickness of the wires you use to connect to the battery to charge it. So we're talking, you know, 10 or 15 minute charging time and 600 miles driving time. Do you know what the name of the book is or are you going to wait till you finish it before you name it? Uh... I've been asked not to divulge the name of the book uh -oh. yet All right. because I, need, I still have got yet to sign a deal with the publisher. Uh, don't tell us then. Good. No, yeah. we want to get, wanna... get you a good deal. You've got a great co-author with Gina Smith. John, it's, always, yeah, yeah. it's such a pleasure to talk to you. And I'm just glad to see how, how well you're doing, how engaged you are. And uh, it sounds like you're having a lot of fun. And by fun. the way, if people want to reach me on J.D. Crunchman on all social networks. J.D. Crunchman, including... Facebook. Skype and Google Plus. Uh, AIM, Google Plus. It's all there. JD Crunchman. Hang right out. To me. I do respond. Uh, friend me on Facebook. Uh, well, you know, go up to my Facebook wall. I got a lot of really cool things I'm doing. And that's how you can get in touch with me through Facebook and through, uh, of course, through Google Plus and my, uh, my activities on uh, once I get started on uh, the activities that I have on, uh, on uh, Facebook as well, my wall and the stuff that I do. I love it. Have, I just hang came out back with a from legend. the Burning Man Festival, too. It was really amazing. You went to Burning Man? 2,000 people. You are Burning Man, dude. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. They, they... 52,000 people. <laughs> it was the first time in history it sold out. Wow. Yeah. That I heard the weather was, was mild, too. It wasn't as It was hot. very nice. Very That's nice. Cool. Only two nights it got really cold. The rest of the nights was balmy and warm. It was beautiful. It did not rain. <laughs> Uh, there was only one bit of wind storm that they had. Even the winds were mild. This year was probably the best weather that Burning Man has had ever since the Burning Man. And this has been, this has been my 10th burn. All right. Well, John, it's such a pleasure Uncle. talking to you. And I hope that next time you're in, up in our area, we can get you up here to the studio and, and uh, get you to sign some of these. Well, you know, I lived in Petaluma, you know. What? I didn't know that. I grew up in Petaluma. I lived right across the street from a chicken farm. I had no idea. And my dad would give me a quarter to go over there and get a dozen eggs from the chicken farmer. And I'd, I'd help the chicken farmer collect eggs and stuff like that. Yeah. No yeah. yeah. I was on, it was on Madison Street. Madison and Payran Street, actually. You know where that's at? Yeah, I know exactly where that's at. Yeah, that's where I live. Small world. Well, you've got to come back and uh, we'll, we'll, you could take us on Captain Crunch's tour of Petaluma. <laughs> there you go. I wouldn't recognize it now. <laughs> you I mean, probably wouldn't. Completed. You probably wouldn't. I mean, the chicken farms are gone, I'm sure. Yeah, they're all gone. Back, the chicken farm used to go to the Petaluma Creek back there and hang out. That's right. Well, that's still there. Payran's still there. Yeah, yeah. Follow him on Facebook. Follow him on Twitter, JD Crunchman. And on uh, Google Plus, you can actually have a hangout with a legend of the uh, technology industry. Yeah, I'll be making announcements on the Hangout in both my Facebook, Twitter, and the Google Plus, so definitely for sure. Just get, just get, into, my, get into my social networks, and uh, you can get in touch with me very easy there. Thank you, John. Thanks, Leo. Have a great evening. Nice talking to you, John. Okay. You John, bet. Bye-bye, you guys. everybody. J.D. Crunchman. And uh, always a pleasure. It's always fun to talk to pioneers of that era because... Uh, it was a very different time. You know, the source code. The public, <laughs> look at the source code in here. It comes with basic source code for breakout. <laughs> and you type it in, and you play the game. Well, the stories behind these things that are icons, you know, and, and museum pieces in some ways that were just things that he was using. He was I right. I want to fire up our Apple II. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> get, get John to do something on there. Hey, thank you for joining us. Triangulation is a show where we bring the most interesting people in the technology industry here so that uh, Tom and I get to talk to them. Really, that's all it is. That's the only reason we do this show. Just, we just want to talk to these guys. I hope you enjoy it. We do it every Wednesday, 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern. Uh, that would be 2300 UTC at twit.tv. If you've missed any of the shows, and there's a whole bunch of them. In fact, aren't there a bunch of them that we never even put out? We well, get, they were got put out in the specials. They did feed, get put out. So we need to okay. re-put them out. We should re-put yeah. them out, absolutely, because there's so many good shows. And we have many more planned. Who's coming up? Uh, 
Guy Kawasaki next week. That'll be a lot of fun. One of the another Apple legend. Yeah. The first uh, evang guy. marketing evangelist. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, Tom. Stay tuned. This week in Radio Tech is coming up next, and we'll see you next time on Triangulation.